you tell us uh, what uh, investment and impact the Global Fund made in terms of fighting injecting drug users in, the, uh, in terms of fighting HIV AIDS among injecting drug users in the region? Well, the Global Fund hasn't uh, uh, done anything on its own. It's actually by investing in the countries and the people in the countries. And it's really their leadership and their work. Um, and it begins with the affected communities, but also government response. So in some countries, uh, Belarus, Moldova, Romania, um, uh, to some extent Kazakhstan, we have seen significant progress. And there have been investments by the Global Fund that has supported some of that. But it's really been because of the le Georgia uh, also here, uh, Ukraine. Um, so there are countries that are making progress. And the Global Fund has supported some of that, but it really is just support. It's the in-country work by the civil society groups, by the government, by UN agencies that are here, UNAIDS, for example, that that progress is made. Why the Global Fund is supporting harm reduction? Because it works. So harm reduction is proven as the effective tool in people who inject drugs. And it not only works on HIV, it actually works through a societal mechanism. So what's called substitution therapy actually gives people their lives back. Um, many people unfortunately think uh, the use of intravenous drugs is a, is a societal choice in some ways. It actually is an addiction like other addictions. And there's a medical treatment for an addiction as there's a medical treatment for many other addictions, just like there's a medical treatment for depression. There, there is medical treatment that gives people their lives back. And what we've learned is that that substitution therapy not only reduces HIV, one of the ways it reduces HIV is by people become employed. They have their family again. Uh, they don't have to uh, steal in order to obtain intravenous drugs. Uh, and they actually don't need intravenous sharing of drugs that can lead to HIV infection. And so countries, for example, like China, that were totally opposed to harm reduction programs uh, for security reasons, when their security forces understood the impact, not just on HIV, but on actually society, changed completely and now provide harm reduction. So harm reduction works. The evidence is overwhelming. But it works um, not just as an HIV tool, it actually works because it treats an addiction and gives people back their lives. A lot of uh, middle-income countries' uh, global fund projects ended or being ending now. Uh, why did the global fund decide to end projects in these countries? Well, we actually have a transition and it's not middle-income countries. We don't actually end projects until you get to upper income or your disease burden is very low. So it's a combination of how much disease you have, how much HIV and tuberculosis, particular in this region, and also your income status. But it's not, it's not middle income, it's actually upper income, um, so or high income. Um, but as countries have more money themselves, as their economies grow, the external financing does go down, as it should, because countries have to take on more responsibility. But if you look at this current three-year period through 2017, and the previous three-year period, the amount, in the, the amount of money in the region is exactly the same, except for a few countries, because their disease burden is very low, and because their incomes have grown so much, the, money, the amounts are the same or higher in the majority of the countries in the region. For the period beyond that, we'll have to see what the disease burden is, what the income status is, also how much money we're able to raise. Um, and then for the three years beyond that, I think the challenges will become more difficult because the incomes will be growing and the disease burden, we hope, uh, will be declining. We were filming in some countries, for example, Serbia and Bulgaria, where uh, global fund projects ended, and that uh, endangers uh, the existence of harm reduction programs which were dependent on international donors. Mm -hmm. So how can you make sure that uh, you can avoid the same uh, uh, bad examples in the future? How can you work with, with governments to ensure the, that these transitions will be smoother in the future? So we actually are working with governments and uh, doing transition plans, but it's not just us. I mean, it's a, it's a collective effort, um, including with the government, uh, civil society, but importantly, other agencies, UN agencies that are here. Bulgaria is a somewhat unique circumstance. It's in the European Union. So countries that are in the European Union have mechanisms through the European Union and European Commission. And the European Commission and 
that Europe actually is our one of our largest donors, so it makes no sense to them to give money to us to give money to me their member states. So there are other mechanisms within the European Union. Now governments and countries have to access those mechanisms, and so we're working with the parts of the European Union that have those financing mechanisms and the country to make sure the countries are aware of them and can access them. But uh, for countries in the European Union, it's a very different situation, uh, similar to a state in the United States. We wouldn't finance them either. What about countries which are outside of the EU, for example, uh, Serbia, Montenegro, or even Mexico, Thailand, which are facing the same future in terms of harm reduction programs? Well, Mexico transitioned from the Global Fund a while ago. Um, and actually have tried to keep up their uh, harm reduction programs, but you know they're upper middle income countries and so we don't finance large programs in upper middle income countries because it's the responsibility of the governments to fund large scale programs. Um, Thailand is in the process of transition and they actually have a bill before uh, their parliament to finance. In fact their goals for people who inject drugs are doubling uh, as we trans transition from from Thailand. So they're actually projecting a significant increase in services to people who inject drugs in Thailand. Now we have to work with them um, it's, and it's not always through the same mechanism and that often is a challenge and you know some groups are upset that when they don't get funded to do something but if the people get services that's what we're after. So each country is unique and each country is different. Um, Montenegro and, and uh, Serbia have relatively low levels of infection and high incomes and that you know, we also have to fund other countries. So there are countries in Africa that are hundreds of millions of dollars a year underfunded to provide services to their people. And so um, we, our total budget for the world is for less than $4 billion a year. The total need for these three diseases in low and middle income countries is in the neighborhood of $50 billion a year. So, you know, there just isn't the resource. And so if a country has a low disease burden and a high income, external financing is very difficult. So does it mean that in those countries like Russia, Ukraine, where there is a high disease burden, because there is a very rapid uh, HIV epidemic among the, one of the most vulnerable population, you are committed to continue funding these programs? Well, Ukraine were, is very heavily funded by the Global Fund, by far the highest amount of any country in this region. Um, they also have higher income. Uh, Russia is a high-income country, and we don't fund high-income countries. We don't fund uh, programs in high in any high-income countries, and so uh, Russia has uh, is in its last phase of a grant from the Global Fund because they're high-income. Um, uh, so uh, Ukraine is different; it's a middle-income country, and we do finance resources. But they're a upper; they're getting to an upper middle-income country, and so over time they need to assume more responsibility. They are; they actually are increasing their own financing. But there have been difficulties recently um, uh, that have made that complex. Uh, but we continue to work with them. So, but Ukraine, the amount Ukraine has dedicated to it for this three years is approximately the same as it had over the last three years. But there will be a decline over time because they they have resource. But even if Russia is a high income country, but there is lack of political will to support some very important programs, for example, substitution program is banned and there is no funding for needle exchange program. So how flexible are your criteria? Like, are you considering also like uh, political, uh, the, the lack of political will in some countries? No, because our financing comes from a development agency. And once a country is high income, they're responsible for their people. So. Um, I come from a city, Washington, D.C., that has a higher HIV rate than any country in this region that has a higher HIV rate and the same infection rate in the gay community and the same infection rate in some places as the uh, in drug and drug use population. We don't have programs in the United States either. So once you're high income, you're responsible for your people. So what do you suggest for those civil society organizations that uh, are based in those countries where there will, the, the Global Fund projects will end? So how to ensure that there will be a, a transition to domestic funds? So we're working on that collectively, but it can't just be um, civil society in the traditional sense of uh, the populations affected by the disease because that's poli politics is politics and budgets and there's a lot of need no matter where you go. So we are working to engage a broader coalition, um, for example, medical professionals, the faith community, um, 
as well as key affected populations. So we need to engage a broader segment of society so that they're educated about the issues, know about the issues, and become part of a coalition that advocates for resource because alone um, traditional civil society key affected populations will probably not be sufficient. We need to have a broader coalition of people who are supportive and that's what we're working to build. But that's not just the Global Fund, it's actually all of us collectively doing that. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.